Hello, Montrose, and welcome to our third episode of Motown Knows. I am Cassie Knust, and I'm a staff writer for the Montrose Daily Press. If it's your first time here, Montrose Knows is our bi-weekly conversation series and podcast where we speak with local leaders and residents about what's going on in Montrose. We broadcast live on Neighbor, our website, on our website, and on our Facebook Live. If you have any questions during the broadcast or things that you would like to talk about, head over to neighbor.com. Uh, it's n-a-b-u-r.com, montrospress.com, and sign in to comment. If you've never heard of Neighbor, it's a free community forum powered by us at the Montrose Daily Press. You don't have to be a subscriber to join. You can find the link in the comments below or on our website bar, our sidebar. As always, I want to thank Delta Montrose Electric Association for sponsoring us and helping us make this happen. This week on Motown Knows, uh, we're talking about Hispanic Heritage Month and issues facing Montrose's Hispanic and immigrant community. I'm joined today by Karen and Ricardo Perez from the Hispanic Affairs Project and B.B. Bird from the Olathe Language Connection, as well as Bobby Fresquez from the Tortilla Flats community. Thank you all for joining us today as we provide insight on a very important subject. Now to get things started off, I'd like to talk about Hispanic Heritage Month. Uh, and I'll direct this question to everybody. Uh, what should we be talking about and thinking about during this time in Montrose? And let me start with Karen. <laughs> um, sure. Well, thank you again for the invitation. Um, you know, I think Hispanic Heritage Month is a great time to really lift up the significant contributions and influence of our Hispanic Latinx communities um, here in the United States. Um, of course, we shouldn't just do this once a year. We should consistently be thinking about how um, we can elevate the voices of our Latinx leaders, um, whether they're longtime members of the community or newcomers. Uh, we work specifically with the immigrant population and in Montrose County, there's, I think uh, after the 2020 census came out, I think there's uh, a little over 21% Hispanic population in Montrose County. So it's pretty significant. And I think we really need to make sure that we're doing more as a community to elevate those voices and recognize the important community and economic contributions. Absolutely. And you know, what can the Montrose community do to help in this kind of work? Yeah, I'll open it up to anybody. <laughs> um, how about Ricardo? <laughs> I'm going to pick on you now. Yes, and you, um, your, your question, I had challenged to hear you very well. No problem. So what Karen was talking about, uh, what can we as a com uh, community here in Montrose do to help the issues that, you know, the Hispanic community is facing here? The immigrant community is here from the very beginning of the foundation of the Montrose in the uh, city, county, and the Western Slope. There is a, a long history of presence. Probably something very important for us is to recognize the diversity. This is so important and we need a long road to advance in recognizing the diversity is coming from immigrants from Latin America, South America, Mexico, but also many people coming from uh, to live here in this town from all places around the world. And we as organization, we are part of, uh, we had a very important program, the immigration legal assistance, and we we are seeing every week when we are connecting with the residents becoming asking to become a citizens or applying to become a citizens. And this is not only from Mexico or South America, but many other places we have from Asia, also uh, from Africa. Um, and we are very proud to be part of this community in the way we are connecting uh, with our neighbors and celebrating the diversity we have. Absolutely. And, you know, with that kind of diversity, you know, one large barrier that immigrants t um, often face or even the, in the community or language. So I was hoping to look at, um, go to UBB for this. Um, what kind of services does the Olathe Language Connection offer? You're muted. 
Okay, sorry about that. Um, so yeah, Olathe Language Connection, we train bilingual folks to be qualified, competent interpreters. And if they wanna join our organization, they can come on as contractors and we will find work for them and provide qualified and sometimes certified interpreters and translators to work within our community. We also work with businesses to provide interpreters, translate their documents and make recommendations regarding language access in terms of signage and inclusivity of cultures. Mm -hmm. Now, can you go a little bit more into the importance behind um, having this language access for the community? Of course, it is very important. So language access mapping or just providing uh, language access to various organizations is the process that supports a strategic effort to eliminate um, or reduce limited English proficiency as a barrier uh, to accessing information. Any organization that serves a population with limited English proficiency should have a language access plan in place that includes an actual document that out outlines how businesses will address language barriers. Um, it also establishes a language access team, um, understand language services, best practices, um, access valuable information and resources. Communication and language assistant provides guidance on how to effectively meet patients' communication needs including sign language, braille, or oral interpretation, and written translation. So as guests, clients, patients enter a building, whether it's a courthouse or a hospital, um, they know where to go. The signage is also in their language, and it makes them feel included, and they can figure out where they're going and what they need to do. Amazing. And so how many do you currently have at the center? Well, we only have a couple. Um, I've got a training coming up and I'm hoping to pump out four more. <laughs> so um, we were moving forward. It's been a little bit slower, but um, I've got a training coming up. And so we're probably going to have about six uh, contractors on staff. Wow. Well, thank you, Bibi. Um, I'm going to move forward a little bit um, over to Bobby Fresquez. Um, Bobby is a resident um, of the Tortilla Flats community here in Montrose, um, as well as a member of our Hispanic community here. So I was hoping to get your perspective as well. Um, you know, what are some barriers or issues that you should be addressed? Um, well, I first I wanted to add that um, although they talked about the immigrants coming in and um, and needing the the interpretations for that or translations, but there's um, several of the Hispanics here who have been here for hundreds of years. And um, uh, most of us know the language. And in fact, most of us don't know the Spanish language, which we lost um, due to um, being um, back in the day when we were uh, teased for knowing Spanish or and uh, not being able to uh, communicate with the teachers and we'd get in trouble. So then our parents thought, well, it's got to be in it's got to be a bad thing. Uh, we don't want them to get in trouble. So therefore we weren't taught the, the language. Um, and then I think also if we could have adv advocacy and um, just acknowledgement that we are here and um, you know we're good good people and we're a good part of the, the community. Okay. Um, and what was your question to me? Sorry. No, that was that was a great point. I mean, okay. so brought that up. Um, and I mean, that really moved it right into my question. I was going to ask, you know, what kind of barriers or issues you think should be addressed within um, both communities, both the Hispanic and immigrant community, as well as the one that you live in, Tortilla Flats. Mm -hmm. um, some of the barriers is um, it could be inequality. We have. Uh, if, as you can see that we're underrepresented in several of the job markets that are that are here. And um, I think that if um, the students could be encouraged to, that they can do this, they can be teachers, they can be lawyers, they can be doctors, um, a little more, more encouragement, a little bit more shoving toward that area that then they can believe in themselves. Um, uh, some of the, 
other barriers is like um, we live in our, our neighborhood. Um, it's an old neighborhood, but with good people. Um, and we've just kind of been ignored. Um, we don't care to have like the fancy homes and, you know, all that. We just, uh, our main focus is surviving and um, family. Um, so, and I think that, that um, with this side of town, you know, we've um, asked for different things to be done or to look at through the city, but um, it's gone to deaf ears. You know, we, uh, for example, we have the, the mag chloride here in, in our neighborhood. It's big and it's ugly. Um, and it just made the neighborhood look bad. Um, and then we have the, the railroad tracks that are kind of, uh, on one section of the town on North 4th Street. It's, um, it's kind of difficult to get across. And if you don't know how bad it is, the, you have to be careful coming across or you can ruin your car or a bike or, or something like that. But I think it's just um, the voice that we have. We don't have a many advocates for us. Um, I guess we're kind of uh, silent and uh, ill-prepared and and uh, just not ready to, to face <laughs> things like this. Yeah. Uh, and I know at, at the recent forum for the Historical Preservation Survey, the, the neighborhood's undergoing I believe it was you that brought up that the neighborhood's looking to uh, have their voice heard because it hasn't been heard in the past. Uh, so is there anything else that the community just wants to say? Yeah, um, I think that um, we're happy here, but with the new um, Mayfly coming in, and uh, I think that some of the neighbors are worried about um, they've taken over, like they've taken over, that's what they're saying. They're taking over that area. What are, what's going to happen to our homes? Are they going to try to come and take our areas, our homes that we've lived here? There's multi-generations that lived here and, and divorce, diverse families. So um, I think that's probably one concern that we have in this area. Absolutely. Oh, thank you so much, Bobby. Um, well, I'm going to circle back around to Karen and Ricardo for a moment, and I'd like to bring up a current event, one from today. Um, today, a major protest uh, led by undocumented families and allies occurred over at the Golden Gate Bridge today, and it shut down the bridge temporarily, but uh, they were advocating for... So, uh, again, as I was saying, I haven't read the full details of what happened in San Francisco this morning, um, but... Um, the need for some sort of federal immigration reform is certainly a hot topic right now. I think immigration has been one of those issues that, um, well, let's just say we use immigrants as scapegoats to not address the issues. It's a very complex, dynamic issue. Um, I think most people can agree that we rely on uh, immigrant labor to keep our economy afloat. That certainly was something that we saw throughout the pandemic and we continue to see how important our essential workers are. Yet Congress is unwilling to take action. Um, things felt, we felt pretty optimistic that Congress was going to include immigration um, in the budget reconciliation bill that's under consideration. Um, but I think with current events, with um, the tragic situation of in Afghanistan and thousands of refugees coming to the United States, as well as the humanitarian crisis in Haiti. And we see tens of thousands of Haitians fleeing to the Southern border. Um, it, mi it mixes things up. It confuses those issues with um, the, the crisis that millions of families uh, in the United States are facing after 10, 20, 30 years of a no action on immigration. And so um, I think what happened in San Francisco this morning is really um, a sign of where we're at. Uh, last week, we sent one of our staff members to Washington, D.C. with a statewide delegation of the Colorado Immigrant Rights Coalition to a national march on Washington to urge Congress to take action on immigration that includes a pathway to citizenship. I think it's time for us to stop playing with people's lives um, for undocumented families that live in limbo. They don't know what's going to happen one day to the next, um, but they do 
get up and go to work every day. They take their children to school. They participate as best as they can in our communities. And so I think we really owe it to them to take action. And I think, again, San Francisco is a good example of the urgency when people feel compelled to put their lives on the line um, and risk deportation, incarceration. Um, it shows that um, we have a crisis on our hands. Absolutely. And I think some people might have confusion after um, as to what pathway to citizenship might mean. They might think that there's only one way to it. Uh, so I was hoping you could maybe explain a bit more what that looks like. You know, what are the different options? Sure. So immigration is really complicated. You know, there's a lot of myths out there. People think, you know, if people would just come here the legal way, they'd come here the right way. Well, that right way doesn't exist. Otherwise, people would come that way. And so when we're talking about fixing our broken immigration system, um, there's some examples of, of temporary fixes um, like DACA, like you see in the photo there, um, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, which is not an immigration status. It's a temporary protected status, which allows young people who were brought here as children um, access to a work permit and a temporary protection from deportation, but it does not give them status. There's other statuses. Um, the TPS program, which is temporary protected status, um, has benefited people in many different countries um, who have fled natural disaster, war, that type of thing, but it doesn't give them status. And so when we talk about a pathway to citizenship, we mean that we need some sort of legalization similar to the 1986 amnesty program that was the last major reform that allows people to, with good moral character to actually take the right steps to um, gain their lawful permanent residency or become green card, green card holders um, and eventually apply for US citizenship. So we want, we want real permanent reforms that allow people um, some sort of um, uh, relief um, and so that they can be active members of our community. Otherwise, it's just an ongoing process. We've seen through DACA, the DACA rulings over the last uh, few years, DACA's on, DACA's off, we're going to cancel it, we're not going to. And so for young people who have to apply for a temporary work permit every 18 months, their lives are in limbo. They re don't really know what's going to happen uh, the day after tomorrow. So that's what we mean when we talk about a real reform and a real fix. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, I know that HAP is very big on educating the community around their rights. So, um, you know, can you expound a bit more on this? You know, what what are their immediate rights that they should know about? Well, I'd actually like to invite Ricardo if you want to jump in so I'm not doing all the talking here. <laughs> Hi, Ricardo. Yes, thank you. Um, Bobby was talking very clearly about uh, inequality, how uh, the all Hispanic living for hundreds of years here suffer in a, uh, social and economic inequality until today. And with the new immigrants, it's happening the same. So with the Hispanic Affairs Project, uh, it's a very unique organization in the Western Slope because uh, we are very feeling uh, many social, economic, political problems, exclusion of new immigrants or Latinos, Hispanic, people of color, minority groups are facing every day in the workplace, in, this, in the street, wherever. Uh, for that reason, uh, from the very beginning in HAP, we start working for social justice. Uh, we start working for immigrant integration. So um, remember the, the people who signed the Constitution of the United States, they were immigrants. So we are um, in the same situation trying to be sure that the immigrants have the same rights and responsibilities and they are enjoying the same rights and responsibilities. Many times this is not the case. And we are seeing abuses and many advantage are taking bad people over immigrants because the lack of migration status. So organizations like this is experience happening with the Tortilla Flats, which is a very dear old Hispanic neighborhood. And we care, we love a lot this community. 
And the same is happening with the uh, Bibi was, uh, was talking about the language justice. So as organizations and groups and people active in the community, we are trying to support our neighbors. This is about how we can respond for having a more safe, um, better community for Montrose. And this is our, this is our, uh, uh, this is what we are looking for as organization. Absolutely. Um, Bobby, I'm going to come to you for a second. And um, as someone who's a bit on the ground there, um, would you say that in your experience, people know that they have access to these resources uh, and do they know their rights? Um, I really don't think that they understand that. Um, you know, we uh, have had advocacies, advocates earlier in um, the years, which I could name a few because they were my cousins, but um, they kind of um, have, you know, moved moved uh, away. But we have like, um, we had the MADA that our residents themselves got the MADA and put it together. And I think MADA used to help people uh, with rights and that. But I really think people don't understand that. So they kind of just um, stay stay away and just kind of take whatever abuse that they that they get they're not sure what to do to do about it or where to go and how did you see this um, impacted during the pandemic how did i see it impact did you see um any kind of further impact did you see this escalate during the pandemic um get worse mm -hmm. at all mm, i think that I'm not so sure about the, the pandemic, but with the last, it's all political. So uh, a lot of the political stuff comes up and I think there, it just come out more that um, I guess they perceive us as not being, um, that we don't deserve things that we should be getting or uh, deserve less. But in the pandemic, I think that there was a lot that of people that were working and they had to work. They were essential workers um, for that. Yeah, and I know in a recent discussion with um, with Karen, actually, this was this came up, um, you know, that uh, undocumented workers mm -hmm. or those in the community uh, were not able to uh, to miss work due to COVID. So, um, I mean, it's this. Was this, um, I would say, was this an issue that you witnessed uh, to any kind of degree in your community? Um, no, not that I can recall of, of that. And, and it could have happened to some people, but I was not, I'm not aware of it. Okay, great. Um, and Karen and uh, Ricardo, would you be able to add in on that? As far as pandemic, I mean, I think when we discussed um, earlier in the year, Cassie, uh, a lot of immigrant workers in particular were considered essential workers during the pandemic. Um, and a lot of work, these workers didn't have access to any sort of paid medical leave. And so they couldn't afford to take a take a sick day. I mean, think about it. If you have a family and you're the main provider, uh, you get sick or maybe you've been exposed to COVID, you really can't afford to take take the time off because you still have to pay the bills. Um, and with all of the uncertainty, there were, you know, a lot of people I think who were out of work and then um, it was like, okay, it's back to work. Um, they didn't really have, have an option. So that was, that was certainly um, a challenge. And we definitely received inquiries from people. Like there's someone who has COVID at my workplace. What do I do? If I tell my employer, I might get in trouble. Will I lose my job? What's going to happen? And so those were, I think, really, really difficult times for everyone in our com community, but particularly for some of our essential workers who, who had um, little option. Right. And, um, you know, just were you are there any additional laws or legislation that um, the community should know about that might protect them against situations like this? Good question. Um, I mean, 
Ricardo, you have anything <laughs> to add? I mean, we've we certainly have a lot of um, new important laws that have been passed over the last last few years. I don't know specifically for the pandemic. Um, I know that there was a paid sick leave um, bill that was passed um, that increases the amount of sick leave, and particularly for for COVID. Actually, Ricardo was appointed to a, a special task force. The um, was it the equity COVID equity task force, Ricardo, would you like to talk more about some of the recommendations that came out of that task force? It was a table appointed by the governor, really focused on immigrants, refugees, and communities of color to make sure that they were not left out of the pandemic. Yes, exactly. Uh, was, uh, it was an invitation from the governor, uh, Jerry Polis, to participate, to create a table with uh, rep people representing organizations and communities of color across to the state. And I think we were around 25, 26 uh, participants, and we were trying to draft a plan in order to ensure um, people of color, minority groups, they uh, received information that normally is, was running from the very beginning in English, but not in other languages. And this happened in this state, this happened also in Montrose County, that in the very beginning of the pandemic, the pandemic, the, we had a, a lot of actions in, in terms of prevention, but suddenly the, uh, the Hispanic, the, the, the Spanish speaking community, they were left behind. So we were trying to be sure that the educa information, education, uh, vaccination later uh, was accessible to everyone in equal level. So, um, this was a very important work, and this table was uh, running for a while, no anymore. Um, uh, 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 and we are participating now in other tables in the state level. But the intention, um, and we are very, very happy to see how the our legislators in Colorado and also our uh, governor are very aware about issues on inequality, and we are trying to support it because this is the way we can improve the quality of life for all residents in Colorado, no matter where we are coming from, no matter if we are good uh, speaking in English or not, but in the way that we are working, living, uh, our children are growing here, and this is our home. And this is very important for us to, to participate. So the Hispanic Affairs Project from the very beginning was uh, active, something we did it, um, uh, here for Montrose and other communities around was creating the Western Colorado Immigrants Relief Fund, was uh, trying to be sure that um, especially single mothers or low-income workers, farm workers, construction workers who suddenly or uh, housekeeping, housekeeping, people who were not able to work because COVID, uh, we were trying to support them. And this happened thanks to foundations and also many community members, allies, and donors, individual donors. Great. Thank you so much. Um, and before we before we close, because we're about to wrap up, I want to open the floor up to everybody. And um, if anyone has anything to add that they want to share with the community, um, please, please share with us. <laughs> I'd like to share that um, about the historical p preservation that we have a site here that um, it's the Morada site and it's an old chapel um, and it, there used to be it's a prayer house and um, we had uh, several of our family members um, that were penitentes part of the members of the the prayer house and hopefully that maybe we can get that site uh, made historical and we can have some type of uh, some type of symbol there that showed it that that it was there at that at one time. Great, thank you, Bobby. Anyone else like to add anything in? All right. Well, that'll wrap up our third episode today of Motown Knows. And thank you so much to our guests, Karen Perez, Ricardo Perez. Mm -hmm. Phoebe Bird and Bobby Fresquez. Uh, and a big thank you to Delta Montrose Electric Association too for sponsoring this event. If you want to learn more and talk more about our Montrose community, remember to go to neighbor at 
N A B U R T N N A U B R dot Montrose Press dot com and sign in. And Neighbors a free online community forum for you to connect with your neighbors as well as journalists at the Montrose Daily Press. Motown Knows was created by Justin Tubbs and Josue Perez. It's produced and edited by Sean Fitzpatrick and Sean Flannelly and overseen by Dennis Anderson. See you two weeks from now for our next episode, and be sure to check out the podcast on Apple Podcasts and Spotify if you missed our last two episodes. Thank you so much.